Interposed between the sea and the plains of Bengal, on the easternmost coast of India, lies an immense archipelago of islands. This archipelago stretches for almost 300 kilometers from the Hooghly River in West Bengal to the shores of Meghna in Bangladesh. They number in thousands. Some are vast, and some no larger than sandbars. Some have lasted through recorded history, while others have just washed into being. The islands are the river's offerings through which they return to earth what they have taken from it. To the world, this archipelago is known as the Sundarban, meaning beautiful forest. Some believe that the word Sundarban is derived from the name of a common species of mangrove, the Sundari tree. In the record books of the Mughal emperors, this region is named not in reference to a tree, but to a tide, Bhati, the ebb tide. It is only in falling that the water gives birth to the forest. Here there are no borders to divide fresh water from salt river from sea, even land from water. The river's channels are spread across the land like a fine mesh, creating a terrain where the boundaries between land and water are always unpredictable. Some of these channels are mighty waterways, 
stretched so wide across that one shore is invisible from the other. Others are no more than two or three kilometers long and only a few hundred meters across. Because of the inland tides, thousands of acres of forest disappear under water every day, only to re-emerge hours later. The powerful currents reshape the islands. Here, for hundreds of years, only the truly dispossessed brave the man-eating tigers and the crocodiles to eke out a precarious existence from the mud. The history of the area can be traced back to 200 to 300 AD. A ruin of a city built by Chand Sadagar has been found in the Bagmara forest block. During the Mughal period, local kings leased the forests of the Sundarbans to residents. In this period, Raja Boshant Rai and his nephew took refuge in the Sundarbans from the advancing armies of Emperor Akbar. Many of the buildings which were built by them later fell to the hands of Portuguese pirates, salt smugglers and dacoits in the 17th century. Part of the present population of Sundarbans had settled in the 1920s Others have come in successive waves, some after the partition of the subcontinent in 1947 and some after the Bangladesh war in 1971. The crab catchers are descendants of the tribal lot who once came all the way from Chota Nagpur during the British regime and settled in the Sundarbans. These tribals had come with the aim of engaging themselves in farming activities in the Sundarbans almost a century ago. Presently they are below the poverty line, bereft of minimum facilities and are treated as aliens. Hunger and catastrophe are a way of life. The land, because of its salt, bears poor crops and cannot be farmed all year round. Most families subsist on a single day meal. The embankments suffer periodic breaches because of floods and storms, rendering the land infertile for several years at a time. Increase in salt content of the soil due to sea water gushing in through the breaches makes the soil unproductive. Thus, dire poverty and hunger drives the people to hunting and fishing. The terrain, though resourceful, is hostile to human beings, as if determined to destroy or expel him. Every year, dozens of people perish in the dense foliage, killed by tigers, snakes and crocodiles. The statues in the little shrines outside the houses are of Bonobibi and Dokinrai, blessings of whom are sought before one ventures into the wilderness in search of honey or firewood. The legend of Bono Bibi begins in Arabia. Ibrahim, a Sufi faqir of Medina, was the father of the blessed twins Bono Bibi and Shah Jangoli. When they came of age, they were told of a mission they had been chosen to undertake. They were to travel from Arabia to a country of 18 tides, or the Sundarbans, to make it fit for human habitation. The mangrove forest and the eighteen tides was the realms of Dokin Rai, the tiger king. One day, Dokin Rai heard strange new voices calling out the Azan and noticed that Bono Bibi and Shah Jangoli had come into his territory. 
the trespassers irked Dokin Rai, and a pitched battle followed. Bono Bibi won, but she mercifully granted one half of the land of eighteen tides to remain a wilderness under Dokin Rai. The other half was claimed by Bono Bibi for safe human settlement. The story goes on to describe a coexistence of man and animal in this rich biodiversity. The people frequent the forest in search of livelihood. The crab catchers in the Sundarbans live like castaways, unwelcome among the other villagers. They survive near the embankments, being mostly prone to attacks of nature and predators, and run the maximum risk of being mauled to death by tigers. They go to the forest sometimes with their family members, searching for their daily livelihood. While concentrating on their search, they may be dragged by a tiger. It is an example of a perilous contact between man and man-eater in mangrove swamp, where humans are often falling prey to beastly attacks of tigers. With the multiplying attacks, it is a familiar story for thousands of people in the Sundarbans who strive to survive under daunting circumstances. A cap cratcher engrossed in his catch hardly gets time to simply leave the iron stick and run for his life.
With the passage of time, the landless and the homeless appeared at different parts of the islands, cleared the mangroves, built embankments and put up huts. This territory fascinated them, as if it was another world with its history and myth. The market days are a big and important event. Farmers and fishermen sell their products and purchase what they cannot produce themselves. Tradespeople from other areas offer all kinds of curios. People come from near and far and thus the market days are an important platform for communication and information. The major means of transportation are water-based. Anything that is not available locally has to be brought in by boat. Accordingly, the shores are well connected by this traffic. Fishing is a way of life for the inhabitants of tide country. The new settlers found that there were many species of fish in the Sundarbans. The water of the river and the sea do not intermingle evenly and create microenvironments for different species to survive. Thus, fishing has become an easy way of survival. Many fishermen travel for days in search of catch using small boats or trawlers as home. These temporary homes require a few thousands to lakhs of rupees to be built. The trawlers venture into the waters for more than three or four months at a time and have arrangements for refrigerating the catches. But as the people make their way through the waters, strings of predators follow. The water not only sustains a variety of fish, but also gargantuan crocodiles. Loss of lives has become a natural consequence, both in water as well as on land. Year after year, these islands have seen so much suffering, so much hardship and poverty, so many catastrophes. Sundarbans was the first mangrove forest in the world to be brought under scientific management. The area was mapped by the Surveyor General as early as in 1764 after proprietary rights were obtained from the Mughal Emperor Alamgir II by the East India Company in 1757. The Sundarbans was declared a reserved forest in 1875-76. There are over 4.5 million people residing in 52 villages. These people are directly or indirectly dependent on the forest reserves, which are continuously depleting with time. The man-animal conflict is at its peak, thus leading to retaliatory killings. A very large number of people are killed by the tigers in the core areas of the forests. The people of Sundarbans have no basic amenities such as electricity, schools, hospitals and dispensaries and their per capita income is extremely low. There is extremely poor participation of the majority of the people in decisions that affect their lives. Rising sea levels in the Sundarbans have seen excessive salinity in the soil and river water, leading to the slow death of the magnificent mangroves that protected these islands and the hinterland.
from the cyclones that sweep across the Bay of Bengal. For the people here, it will mean less peaceful days and more stormy nights. With the mangroves gone, cyclones generated in the Bay of Bengal and sweeping across the Bangladesh hinterland will hit much harder than they have done so far. The devastation has already begun. Isla affected people have helplessly cowered in their roofless huts and watched the waters rising and gnawing at the mud and the sand they had laid down in the form of embankments to hold off the river. The devouring waters ate its way through the earthworks, stalking the people wherever they were. Rivers tore off pieces of land and carried them away. The wind picked up animals and threw them at distances. Isla has gained international attention, but the raging storms in the Sundarbans continue with their insatiable monstrous appetite. Two hundred million years ago, all the continents once formed part of an enormous single landmass called Pangaea. This mass was surrounded by a giant ocean known as Pathalassa. Tectonic movement of the earth broke Pangaea into the landmasses Laurasia and Gondwana land. It took 65 million years of drift to form Laurasia and Gondwana land, as tectonic movements are slow. Laurasia and Gondwana land in turn broke up into the continents, which drifted to their present locations. Between the 12th and 15th century AD, the Bengal basin suffered some neo-tectonic movement. The flow of the Ganga shifted almost totally eastward from Bhagirathi into the river Padma, now in Bangladesh, as the upper crust of the earth might have been lifted towards the west, forcing the Ganga to drain mostly through its eastern channel, Padma. The sources of all the rivers in the western part of Sundarbans have been progressively silted up thus disconnecting the inflow of sweet water into the mangrove delta. Rising sea levels in the Sundarbans have seen excessive salinity in the soil and river water, leading to the slow death of the magnificent mangroves that protected these islands and the hinterland from the cyclones that sweep across the Bay of Bengal. For the people here, it will mean less peaceful days and more stormy nights. With the mangroves gone, cyclones generated in the Bay of Bengal and sweeping across the Bangladesh hinterland will hit much harder than they have done so far. An unprecedented rate of sea level rise has already submerged some of the Sundarban islands and poses an imminent threat to the others.
They set a precedent for the impacts of sea level rise which poor populations in low-lying coastal India will face in the coming years. Increased displacement of people due to loss of habitation and land will increase the count of climate refugees. Over 70,000 people from the Sundarbans are under a risk of losing their habitat permanently due to sea level rise, increased cyclone intensity and flooding by the year 2030. Mangrove planting will arrest the rate of coastal erosion making these islands survive longer. This is an immediate adaptation measure. However, it is evident that because of global warming, a substantial part of the Sundarbans might disappear from the map. Shrimp cultivation carried out in the Sundarbans is a new curse for the people inhabiting that area. Shrimp aquaculture has displaced traditional occupations. Sharecroppers have been forced out by shrimp farmers onto the forest in search of an alternative source of livelihood, thus increasing pressure on the steadily depleting resources of the ecosystem. Thousands of men, women and children are engaged day and night harvesting shrimp seedlings with their push, pull and trap nets in the rivers. All sources of employment being closed, large number of the affected people have been forced to turn to collection of shrimp fry, crab and shell. The Thai people who live on the 102 inhabited islands cannot afford the luxury of abstention of not taking chances. Death and survival are two sides of the same coin, for they have no choice other than to fish in waters or venture into the tiger domain to collect honey and wood. As the evening shadow lengthens and an inky blue replaces the azure skies, unknown fears creep in. Attack on fishermen usually occurs at about midnight when they may be fast asleep. One may awake with the horror to feel the warm putrid breath of a tiger on his face and to see its eyes glowing in the flickering light of the kerosene lamp beneath the boat's bamboo canopy.
Around 20,000 kg of honey is collected every year from the forests of the Sundarbans. The number of official honey collectors has dwindled from about 1,500 a few years back to about 700 at present, though this doesn't include the illegal collectors. Before leaving for the expedition, the honey collectors make offerings to Bon Bibi, Monusha and Ghazi Pir to invoke their protection. Religion is a vital issue for the people at Sundarbans. The people have taken recourse to the same religious belief. It is the only place in the world where both Hindus and Muslims pray to the same gods. The Muwalis of the Sundarbans face great dangers while collecting the precious wild honey from the forest. They enter deep into the forest at the risk of their lives. Beside tigers, they also have to face many other problems in the forest, which include forest robbers and lack of arms to protect themselves. Mowalis are very poor people and have no savings. So before they go to the forest, they borrow from money lenders. Upon return from the forest, they have to pay a great amount to the money lender. During the actual search, the collectors carry only a thin cotton cloth, matches for lighting torches and a basket for the honey and a matchet for slicing the hive. They comb the dense forest at amazingly high speed, staying within calling distance of each other. When a Mowali discovers a honeycomb, he alerts the others with a loud, excited shout. The group then gathers at a short distance from the beehive and quickly makes torches with dried green leaves. Thick smoke envelops the surrounding areas once the torches are lit. In the safety of this smoke, the Moali approaches the beehive and the agitated bees disperse. The Moali in charge of slicing the hive 